Can you see me? Yes, yes. How are you, Mariana? Fine. <laughs> nice to have you. Nice to have you. This Thank week. you very much for the invitation. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. So in a, in a couple of minutes, we are going to to, to begin, okay? Okay. So you... Should I share the screen already? Uh, sorry? Should I share the screen? And no. we... Just share when, when I'm going to, 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 to introduce you, okay? Because now I'm going okay. to just to welcome people. So you have uh, more or less 25 minutes plus five minutes for question and answering, okay? Okay, perfect. So just a couple of minutes, uh, we're going to start. Thank you very much. And there is also there is also Nuncia that you can see in the video. That is the other chair of the of the session. So yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mariana. See you in uh, two minutes. Great. See you. Welcome everybody to the second session of analytical chemistry at the autumn meeting for young chemists in the biomedical uh, sciences. We had very amazing presentation, very amazing invited uh, lecture and keynote uh, speaker in, um, in the previous uh, session of this morning. So we are sure that also the second session of analytical chemistry will be very important in terms of contribution, in terms of high quality of research. And uh, I am with uh, Nuncia, that is uh, the other uh, chair of the session, and we welcome you to, to this. So the, um, the first uh, uh, keynote speaker of this second session is uh, Mariana Medina Sanchez, that uh, we would like to thank for a presence uh, to our uh, conference. And uh, Mariana Medina Sanchez is a group leader of micro and nanobiomedical nano engineering group at the um, Leibniz Institute for Solid State and Materials Research in Dresden. Uh, the research of uh, Dr. Uh, Medina Sanchez uh, is focused on uh, the use of nanotechnologies like uh, nano and micromotors, uh, also applied to the development of novel biosensing uh, uh, architecture. And uh, Dr. Medina Sanchez uh, has a very high level profile uh, uh, that is uh, represented by an IH index of 30 with a lot of publication, a lot of citation in the most reputed journals uh, in the field of nanotechnology and uh, analytical chemistry. So, Dr. Uh, Medina Sanchez, uh, when you are ready, you can share your screen, and we are we are ready to 
listen. Thank you. Can you see my slide? Yes, yes, we can see. Yes. Okay, great. So first of all, uh, thanks very much for your kind introduction and for the invitation to, to this conference. And I'm going to talk about strength engineering and how uh, these uh, novel concepts can be used to create highly compact and sensitive 3D uh, biosensing devices. Okay, so uh, for people who are not familiar with this concept, the strain engineering is a strategy uh, of modulating the strain of materials in specific properties. For instance, in the semiconductor manufacturing, this, uh, the strain in a transistor uh, enhances the electromobility. And uh, this strain can cause also material deformations, which can lead to the formation of cracks. Uh, but um, if uh, we control the way how these cracks are formed, uh, for example, as um, in 1996, uh, the group of Kutakovsky uh, made by using um, an engineering approaches uh, where they can uh, do uh, specific patterns on these uh, micro cracks and, and use the, the self assembly. Of, uh, of micro tubes, micro helices, uh, and uh, small devices. Um, you can create a variety of very exciting systems. And at the back then, they were using this for studying ele electron uh, transfer phenomena. Um, nowadays, um, this is uh, converted, or it was converted into what we know as an origami based device. And our institute has been pioneering this field, reporting a variety of floating uh, origami structures, uh, ranging from um, ultra compact uh, micro batteries, uh, optical resonators, microelectronic devices, sensors. And here uh, today, I will be talking mainly about uh, sensing platforms and how uh, employing this uh, rolling technology can create ultra sensitive and ultra compact uh, transducers for biomolecular detection. Uh, it uh, starts with uh, the position of a sacrificial layer that can be, for example, a photoresist or a polymer uh, or, a, or even a metal. Uh, and then on top of it, you, you deposit a B layer of uh, a strain with different strains uh, that is uh, tunable by the deposition rate uh, that you use, for example, in an EV uh, deposition device or risk patterning. And uh, you can create these uh, devices employing inorganic, organic materials, passive and active. And uh, what is uh, here uh, attractive is that you can create very thin films uh, onto the sacrificial layer. And after removing the sacrificial layer uh, due to the intrinsic strain, uh, these layers strain to form a, a microtube uh, or, or a 3D structure in this case. Um, you can see. Uh, in this video, how after uh, adding a solvent, like if, for example, acetone, uh, that removes the sacrificial layer, that in this case is a photoresist uh, A-set, uh, we can observe the self-assembly of many of the tubes uh, in a mass uh, uh, production. But these are just microtubes, and if we want to integrate more functional components on those devices, we have to incorporate uh, additional steps uh, to um, fabricate uh, microelectrodes or, or electronic components that can be used for sensing, amplification, and actuation. Uh, so just for, uh, for explaining briefly how this process is about, we first uh, pattern and deposit the sacrificial layer, that in this case is the germanium layer. We then uh, deposit a V layer of titanium dioxide or silicon dioxide with different strains. And after that, this is a dielectric material. After that, we can pattern our sensors or electrodes that in this case were uh, based on chromium gold. And uh, when we remove the sacrificial layer that uh, is done in this case by hydrogen peroxide or water, uh, the V layer of titanium dioxide is going to form uh, these uh, nice microtubes. You can tune the diameter of these microtubes by changing the thickness of the layers or the intrinsic strain. Um, yeah, in summary, these uh, microelectrodes uh, can uh, be used not only 
for detecting very small amounts of reagents in samples, but also to mimic in vivo like conditions, for example, uh, blood vessels or uh, two-dimensional um, small uh, channels that we have in the body, for example, to study interactions with the biological material. Uh, it's also quite flexible because it allows the integration of uh, different uh, materials from inorganic to inorganic uh, due to the geometry and also the homogeneous electric field that we can get from this uh, structure. We can enhance the limits of detection and the sensitivity and it's compatible to lab on a chip or microfluidic uh, device. That we have developed a variety of sensing uh, devices, which include biosensors, um, cell cytometers, long-term cell monitoring platforms, microtomographs, and uh, recently a uh, confiance sensor actuator and microsystem. So I will go through all these uh, uh, demonstrations very briefly so that you have an idea about the potentialities of these uh, uh, processes to create uh, a variety of, of devices. So the first example is some um, DNA biosensor. This work was in collaboration with Dr. Ivar Luceum and Professor University from the Nice Berman Institute in Dresden. So we developed these uh, three-dimensional uh, tubular electrodes with interdicated um, geometry, and um, we passivate the, the whole structure except the inner part of the tube and immobilize later on um, target uh, DNA, approved DNA. Uh, by it is chemistry of chemistry, so here you can see the whole uh, process. We have the beta electrode, which is corresponding to the inner part of the tube, and we form a self assembly monolayer to later do covalent binding with a DNA probe. And finally, um, we block the, 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 the inactive uh, site and perform the hybridization of the target DNA by microfluidity. Uh, then we uh, realized uh, the detection by using interdimetric um, spectroscopy, and we could achieve the limits of detection down to 70 atom molar uh, without employing any amplification or, label strat or labeling strategy. So it was uh, even four orders of magnitude compared to the standard point of part. And we observed also uh, an interest in behavior in this sense because the change of impedance was opposite as uh, in the planar uh, pointer part. And one of the reasons is that um, the DNA confirmation is also influenced by the electric field. And the electric field in these tubular electrodes are um, enhanced compared to the planar pointer part. And, um, and this might have uh, an effect on the way how the electrodes are passivated and then uh, upon abilitization, how the confirmation change, changes, uh, letting the, the electrolyte um, uh, molecules to interact with the electric surface in a more efficient way. Uh, we also confirm uh, that uh, this uh, sensor was highly selective by employing a non specific uh, target DNA. Uh, in this case, with H influenced the virus H5N5, and we observed that uh, there were no significant changes. Another example of these tubular electrodes is uh, the one I'm showing here for the detection of uh, immunocells. And uh, this uh, is uh, particularly interesting for cell cytometry because you can tune the diameter uh, right to the cell size. And in particular, we detect a human monocyte cd 14 2 uh, and the extracellular matrix that contain expressed cytokine uh, upon um, the activation uh, by introducing uh, liposaccharide. Uh, this was to, to mimic inflammatory responses, and uh, we could, uh, in parallel, observe not only the presence of the cells uh, and how they change in, in shape and, and, um, and conductivity, but also uh, the expressed cytokines, uh, which change the, the background uh, medium conductivity. Here there are some results uh, after different times of, of uh, activation. Uh, and uh, we could see that uh, after uh, six hours, we, we have the, the most significant changes in, in shape and also in conductivity. And we could also distinguish between uh, single cell cell clusters, fragments of cells, and um, also um, the cytokines which change the surrounding medium over different periods of time. 
A similar platform was employed for detecting tumor cells towards dark screening studies. And here we use uh, HeLa cells, cells uh, of cells, uh, which were treated with different concentrations of anti cancer drugs. In this case, we employed campsulfacy, and we could observe uh, also the, the changes in the impedance. Um, depending on, on, the, on the shape uh, of, the, of the cells and the conductivity in the surrounding uh, media. Of course, these are still preliminary results, but we could already see two um, regions where um, we believe uh, the cells uh, undergo apoptosis and uh, also uh, very significant changes on impedance when uh, it changes from apoptosis to necrosis, uh, where the membrane is completely. Um, Broken. Another example is this miniaturized microtomograph. Um, this is basically based on the same technology. We have a roll up microtube, but instead of having just a pair of electrodes, we have an array of electrodes which are arranged, arranged in a way that we can um, monitor or detect all possible combinations uh, when we apply a voltage bias. Uh, between uh, two digits and uh, monitor the whole impedance changes uh, around uh, the sample. So this will um, help us to create um, um, a 2D or a cross-section uh, impedimetric uh, image uh, to especially determine the changes of conductivity of our sample. And this is perhaps the most uh, miniaturized impedimetric tomograph that has been reported so far. Um, so, uh, and we did some uh, demonstrations using, uh, first of all, a Janus ma a microparticle that has a uh, half side uh, coated with a conductive layer, and the other side is a dielectric layer. And we could observe first uh, the conductivity changes uh, by employing uh, simple thickness voltammetries uh, among the different uh, electric pairs. But while uh, when we combine and uh, measure all the possible combinations between these uh, electrodes, we could create a conductivity map, and uh, here uh, I show you some examples where we observe two different sizes of dielectric particles. As well as a Janus particle, we could see differences in conductivity with a special uh, information, uh, and uh, we use it also for monitoring uh, cell death over time. So here, by purpose, we induce cell necrosis by changing the cell medium by um, a more aggressive uh, medium, so to um, break the membrane uh, and we uh, stain the cell uh, with a um, cell viability uh, tips. And we could uh, compare that um, the conductivity uh, was changing wh while the cell uh, integrity was also modified. But what was interesting is that these conductivity changes uh, were observed earlier before the optical um, or, or the organic dyes were visible in the, in the first microscope. So we could uh, uh, see uh, changes at early stage, and maybe uh, I mean it's not invasive as the organic diet. And we can, depending on the frequency that we are using, we can get information uh, from the cell membranes, but also uh, from the cytoplasm and the surrounding medium. So we can gain uh, much more information in a non-invasive manner, and we do monitoring uh, of the living cells over time without using uh, a stain. Yeah, this technology um, can also be used for creating big arrays of microscopes uh, to study single cells. And uh, in this work, we developed transparent tubular microscopes made of um, structural uh, implant material. Uh, this was the titanium neodymium oxide, which is, which is used to replace the bone, uh, solid uh, bones uh, or structural bones. Um, and uh, typically, these uh, implants are, are porous with porous uh, size between uh, 100 micrometer to uh, 500 micrometers. So, uh, but uh, there are still a lot of problems on, on how the, the ocean integration uh, is uh, happening. And there are a lot of problems of biofilm formation. And very often, these implants need to be replaced. So uh, for that purpose, we create these uh, on-chip uh, microscopes mimicking the pores of these uh, bulk implants. 
Uh, and uh, the first challenge was to transfer uh, this uh, implant material into the micro scale, make them transparent because uh, the idea was to be able to observe the behavior of cells using optical microscopy. So they should be transparent, but they should keep the, the same properties as the bulk implant. So we employ um, here um, uh, full place of the position uh, technique and um, uh, using oxide uh, material so that uh, we have it more on a uh, transparent, uh, but also the oxide layer uh, in the outer uh, surface enhance the protein addition and therefore the, the cell proliferation in those materials so we could mimic uh, the surface properties of the, of the implant. Then we study, for example, cell migration, how the cells, the uh, metagenital stem cells, were migrating into these microscopes and interacting with the material. We compare also with the standard silicon dioxide and also plastic uh, petri dishes. And uh, we uh, could see that uh, there are more interaction points or, uh, which are labeled with a uh, vinculin um, dye. And we could see that there are more more joint um, points uh, to these uh, uh, materials compared to the console one. And uh, in, in the 3D scenario, we also observe that the shape uh, changes uh, when it's integrating inside it, adopting a more rounded uh, morphology and uh, have a more random uh, migration mode compared to the planner. Um, in front of us, where you observe a more uh, bidirectional motion of, of cells. Um, and a spread, a spread uh, morphology. So uh, one advantage is that this also mimics more realistic uh, scenarios in vivo and especially uh, regarding the porous uh, material. Uh, and by employing this scaffold, we could also observe early bone formation by a single cell, which was, I think, the first time it was observed. We could uh, analyze after the mineralization of a single cell um, in these microscopes, we could analyze by by PEM um, and express uh, the microstructure uh, that results from, from this mineralization process. And we um, could uh, see that the microstructures have uh, uh, a lot of similarities or, or were almost as the either set aside and also the ratio between calcium and phosphate was. Uh, um, was feeding to, to real uh, bone um, properties. As a follow up work uh, for this uh, microscope, we are integrating uh, electrodes uh, in, in the same structure because we want to do also a detection of uh, really ions that might affect these the interactions between bone cells and micro implants. Um, as well as to do uh, in situ uh, stimulation for, for uh, doing the cell differentiation uh, with physical means rather than with the chemical tools. But this is a still an uh, ongoing project. And the latest device I wanted to show, I want to show you is based on similar responsive polymers. And as I mentioned before, uh, the strain engineering concept uh, also extends to other materials like hydrogels or, or electrostatic polymers. And here, uh, for example, if instead of depositing uh, two B layers of the same material with different strengths, we deposit an active material that changes the shape by, uh, by an external stimuli like temperature, pH, or electrical uh, bias. And on top of it, you deposit a passive layer that can be the thin film of uh, a metal or oxide uh, or also can be a passive polymer, we can uh, induce the self rolling uh, upon uh, this stimuli. So here is an example. We pattern uh, this made of uh, polymethane. Uh, this is an hydrogel that responds to temperature. And if we don't have any passive layer on top, we just uh, see the expansion and contraction of the structures. But if you deposit uh, a thin film on top of this hydrogel, upon applying the stimuli, uh, due to the constriction that you have in one of the, of the degrees of, of freedom, then you have this uh, self-rolling uh, process. This works also with, poly uh, with electroactive polymers. 
uh, in the prison for its qualifying role and uh, to play this uh, uh, in the in the micro tube and by applying a, a voltage bias uh, below one volt, we could also induce uh, in situ the, the shape change of the of the micro tube and this is very promising for sensor actuator uh, systems. And as an example, here we demonstrate a shape controllable microscale device that integrates sensors and actuators. So basically, we have a polymeric uh, platform uh, where we have uh, uh, common volt electrodes. Uh, and uh, in, in the extreme, uh, in, the, in the lateral side, we deposit electro uh, chemically uh, polyperol to help the actuators that will deform or change the shape of the structure, while in the middle uh, section we um, pattern um, certain sensors. So these are not biosensors, but they can be uh, also uh, used for biosensor applications. In this case, we use a strain gauge sensor and a magnetic sensor basically to determine um, how much these sensors were um, deforming and which was the angle of aperture so that we can um, uh, by using a feedback control uh, based on a PAD controller, we can tune uh, the, the um, opening and closing of this uh, sensor actuator system, uh, which is particularly um, important if you are handling or manipulating soft tissues, for example, uh, nerves where are very delicate and you want to access or, or, or detect uh, um, um, uh, electrically. Uh, um, yeah, these uh, these uh, biological tissues you have to adapt to the tissue without damaging it. So uh, we could do a demonstration with a very rigid uh, structure as well as with a soft tissue and and adapt the, the force of the grabbing by by measuring the the deformation of the structure in the other. So yeah, here uh, I there is uh, some more results where you see uh, the compression and the gentle folding of, of the nerve and uh, how the PAD controller uh, switch on and off the, the actuators depending on, on, the, on the required force. Um, in summary, uh, I want to say that the same engineering is a very versatile fabrication method. We can uh, create a highly integrated system, sensors, scaffold, actuators for different biomedical uh, applications uh, uh, of chip. Uh, also, the microtubes in this case can be tuned by, um, by changing uh, the material um, composition, the thickness, the strain uh, within the layers. Uh, they are susceptible to be integrated in microtubic channel. You can also um, a deposit not only electrodes for interimetric or electrochemical detection, but you can also integrate microelectronic components, for example, uh, microamplifiers that in situ can uh, amplify this, the biological signal and it will improve the signal to noise ratio in, in most of the, of the applications. Or you can also have, for example, uh, microantennas or yeah, any other um, active and passive electronic components. Um, they are, can be also used for coastal detection because the diameter fits very well to the cell size, which is typically about 20, 30 micrometers. And uh, they mimic uh, the realistic environment, three dimensional environment, where we can observe and analyze the single cells uh, under more, uh, let's say, natural conditions. And uh, as I mentioned in the last example, we can introduce also electrodes and have uh, dynamic sensor actuator systems for, for example, to do um, grabbing of biological cells or all mechanical stimuli. And this will open a variety of many uh, interesting applications. This is what we envision. Uh, this is called the lab in a chip concept. It's an enhanced version of, of what was uh, proposed some time ago where we have uh, sensors, actuators, um, active walls, uh, and uh, we can uh, do everything uh, in a chip.
I would like I would that I would like to acknowledge my research group and the planning agencies that have supported this, this research and uh, to you for listening. Uh, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to ask. Thank you very much, Mariana, for your very interesting contribution uh, for all your findings. So in, in the way we're waiting for some questions from the, from the audience, I'm going to make you some questions. So uh, of, of course, uh, uh, most of the, the experiments have been carried out in vitro, but which is the, um, the expected that you have for in vivo experiment of this kind of strain engineering? So of you already did something in vivo or there is some limitation yeah, so actually here, um, as you mentioned in the introduction, we are working in two different lines. One is the medical microrobotics and the other is the more on the biosensing and, and platforms for cellular uh, analysis. Uh, and here I show you only the second part, but uh, we have also activities in trying to explain engineering concepts to create uh, um, scaffolds for single cells to, for example, transport uh, sperm cells or to deliver uh, drugs uh, in vivo, and uh, the current status is uh, that we already uh, managed to visualize microscale objects in real time uh, in living mice uh, and actuating them remotely using uh, magnetic fields. Uh, but uh, yeah, but at the moment we have not uh, done yet any biomedical relevant application because uh, you know in Germany also the regulation is quite strict and you have to do. Um, animal applications for every experiment that you plan to do. And uh, we are now in this stage to initiate uh, a small animal experiment with some of the, of the devices mm -hmm. that I have shown. Okay. Also, also your uh, lab on tube approach, your, your, the vision that you, that you offer to, to the community is very impressive. So I have, I have some question about this. So, have you also tried with different approach for fabricating this kind of uh, responsive tubes? Like other, uh, I mean, for example, printing technologies like screen printing te technologies, in inject printing technologies, for example. And also the, the second question is about the, the volume and the, 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 yeah, the volume and even the, the dimension of this lab bomb tube. Well, which are yeah. the dimension, which are the, the volume involved? Yeah, so for the first question, we have not tried this uh, with other technologies. So this is basically photolithography because we are aiming at very small scales. So in the order of, of 10 to 100 micrometer size uh, in diameter. And then, um, yeah, but uh, of course, the uh, screen printing technologies or inject printing technologies that offer other advantages like uh, low cost, uh, mass production, and uh, flexible substrate. So, if, if you aim for maybe bigger structures to, to target uh, more um, um, biomaterials at the tissue level, not at the single cell level, I think they could be suitable hmm? um, due to their resolution. Uh, and I think this answers already the second question you know, about the, the size, the sizes that we are talking about. So uh, these uh, tube diameters are typically of uh, from 10 to 100 micrometer diameter, and the length is about 200 micrometers to centimeters if you want. Uh, the advantage is that you can integrate also several electrodes in parallel and do multi detection or do the repetitions within, within the same tube. Um, and they can be integrated in my creative channel. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you very much for being here, uh, for sharing your uh, enthusiastic research uh, achievements. So we are very glad to, uh, to have you today in our community of young uh, researchers. So you are, you are definitely a, a role model for us. So thank you very much again. To... Thank you for your nice words, and I hope that uh, at least it was uh, motivating you. and show a, a different strategy also to create uh, sensors, <laughs> three-dimensional sensors. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mariana. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So now, Nuncia. Okay. 
Hi everyone again. So now I'm going to continue with the other speakers of this uh, session. So the next one is Marianna Rossetti from University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Okay. Can you hear me? In yes, yes. We can see you and we can hear you. So you can share your presentation. Okay. Okay. okay, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee and the scientific committee for giving me today the opportunity to show one of the, my last work that is about the development of a DNA-based platform for the electrochemical detection of antibodies by exploiting the concept of effective molarity. The, okay. the concept of effective molarity is um, widely used by nature and it consists of bringing close proximity to compound in order to increase their local concentration to control their effective interaction and by um, facilitating their encountering. In um, the last years, many efforts have been devoted by scientists, in particular in the field of DNA nanotechnology, to recreate in vitro this mechanism for a wide range of applications, including biosensing, chemical synthesis, and catalysis. But uh, uh, despite of all of these efforts, uh, just a few examples have uh, been reported in which uh, antibody are used as a uh, uh, template biomolecule to allow the biomolecular confinement of a DNA-based system. So in this work, uh, we uh, wanted to use antibody as an uh, element able to bring in close proximity to um, DNA strand. And uh, in which way we can do this? In uh, this cartoon, I will try to explain the idea at the origin of this work. Uh, so to start, imagine having two, uh, two compounds, a compound that we can call a capture strand, that is a DNA strand that is anchored on the surface of the gold electron that is um, a, working, um, a working electron. And then imagine having another second strand that we can name uh, output strand that is complementary to the capture strand. And it presents also a redox tag like uh, methylene blue. The affinity between these two strands is, uh, uh, is poor because we have just weak intermolecular interaction. One, uh, but what's happened when uh, the binding events uh, um, happens, we'll have that the um, electrox tag will be in close proximity to the uh, surface of the electrode, and this uh, allows the electrode just uh, to the generation of a signal output. But um, as I told you, this uh, the affinity between these two strands is low, so we need a high concentration of output strand to generate the signal output. Now, Now imagine to uh, modify these two strands with an antigen. What's happening in the presence of the specific antibody? The antibody will bring in close proximity the two strands by increasing their local concentration. That means that we need a lower concentration of output a strand to, um, to see, to check a signal output. The difference, the shift between the two binding curves in the presence and the absence of antibody are related to the effect of colocalization induced by the presence of the antibody. How can we use this principle to uh, develop the sensor for the detection of antibodies? The idea is uh, quite simple and is uh, reported in uh, this cartoon. Uh, one of the um, main things that we uh, do when uh, we um, think to develop a sensor is to uh, develop to realize a sensor that is uh, versatile. For this reason, we, uh, at the beginning of the work, we decided to uh, design a um, modular platform. For this, we uh, didn't uh, uh, attach the antigen the recognition element on the DNA strand directly, but we, used, we added in our system a third strand that acts as a scaffold strand and uh, it is reported in uh, the orange portion. So we decided to design two, uh, two strands, the output strand, this contains the methylene blue, and the capture strand that is anchored to the electrode, having two portions that are uh, the same, the blue portion. 
this two portions need for the hybridization with the DNA with the DNA template strand that is the, the that is the strand that uh, allow the recognition uh, with the antibodies. So the idea is to engineering two strands that uh, present a poor affinity in the absence of antibody. So that in the absence of antibody, we will have just a low current signal. In the presence of antibody instead, we want to that uh, the colocalization effect induced by the presence of antibody itself will bring to an increase of the current signal due to the uh, habilitation events that happens between the two strands. As you can imagine, we need to um, uh, test different uh, output modules so that we want to um, choose the best, uh, the best output strand that present poor affinity in the absence of antibody a high affinity in the presence of antibody. For this, we test different variants of the output strand by increasing the number of nucleotides that are complementary to the capture strand. We testing from six to 12 base pairing. And how can you imagine easily uh, by increasing the number of nucleotides that can hybridize, we'll have that the binding curve are shifted toward the uh, left. That means uh, this is, is natural because increasing the number of nucleotides, the affinity between the two strands also in the absence of antibody increase. So we select 10 nanomolar as the best concentration to perform the next experiment that consists in adding increasing concentration of antibody in our system that consists of the, the capture module attached on the, on the electrode and in a fixed concentration equal to 10 nanomolar of output module in solution. As proof of principle, we started by using the dinitrophenol because it's a um, small molecule and uh, uh, that is uh, uh, widely used for this uh, proof of principle uh, studies. And as you can see, also in this case, we observe that when uh, the forming duplex length is shorter, for example, six or eight uh, nucleotides, uh, the uh, concentration of antibody that allow the hybridization and the colocalization effect between the two strands is shifted toward the right. So uh, we need a high concentration of antibody to uh, improve the uh, appearance by the infinity between the two strands. By increasing the, the number of uh, nucleotides to 10 and 12, we obtain very similar affinity. But as you can see, by using the 10 base pairing, we obtain the best uh, sensitivity. Why this? Because when we increase the number of nucleotides, we um, have a portion of uh, a module that binds the capture strand also in the absence of antibody. This is due to, to the fact that we uh, have a, a high um, energy uh, between the two strands. So we selected the 10 BP like the best um, output modules and we performed the next experiment that consists of uh, to add increasing concentration of antibody in uh, blood serum. And then in the second slide, in the second graph, we can see uh, that uh, our um, platform is uh, uh, really rapid. In fact, when we add the saturating concentration of antibody, we can observe uh, um, the, uh, we can observe the plateau after less than 10 minutes. Uh, finally, as you can imagine, this uh, platform is also uh, highly sensitive because uh, uh, the sensitivity is due to the uh, double recognition event that happens between the antibody and the two antigens. Uh, as I told you, one of the, um, of the aim of the goal of this, uh, of this uh, work was also to create a uh, a platform that can be used for uh, the detection of any desired antibody. And to do that is um, uh, we have just to um, modify the scaffold strand with the proper antigen. And uh, we did uh, we did do this for several um, for several antibodies. And in particular, I want to hear I like that uh, we are able to uh, detect the anti HIV by modifying the um, scaffold strand with the peptide pin 17 and also the trasduzumab. In particular, trasduzumab is an uh, um, antibody that is uh, uh, widely used in immunotherapy for the breast cancer treatment. 
and uh, for this, uh, this um, uh, we can uh, we can say that this uh, sensor can find this application in uh, drug monitoring. So, in conclusion, in this work, we have uh, demonstrated how our harness the um, how harnessing the effective molarity we can uh, detect a wide range of uh, antibody in also in orthogonal way in a very simple way. And uh, finally, uh, this um, sensor uh, and the possibility of this sensor is uh, uh, actually in uh, the field of drug monitoring. In conclusion, I would uh, like to thank all the people involved in this uh, project and uh, Alessandro Porchetta, ISPI of this uh, work, and uh, Giuseppe Palleschi and the professor Francesco Ricci that hosting me in their lab and the Fondazione Umberto Veronesi for grant me, and also you for all your kind attention. Thank you, Marianna. Really nice presentation. Let's see if someone has some questions or curiosity. No. Okay, so I just have a simple curiosity. So once you have developed this, um, this device, what do you imagine it's um, as a practical use in clinics? I mean, how can it actually be used then practically and how about its costs to be employed then in the clinics? I mean, it, is, it can be easily affordable or it would be very expensive. No, it's, uh, it's not expensive uh, because the electrodes are, uh, um, uh, are um, a, a screen printed electrode. And uh, actually, on, on the market, uh, one electrode is not <laughs> really cheap because it's more or less uh, one euro for uh, electrode. But uh, uh, today, the, the price of uh, DNA is, uh, is uh, really cheap. So, the platform at the end is uh, more or less one, uh, one euro and 50. <laughs> Okay, if we can do an estimation of the price. But yes, it can be useful because uh, it, the, in particular for uh, the detection of uh, antibody that uh, uh, works in a concentration like in immunotherapy because our, our platform for now is not, uh, is not able to reach the sensitivity of ELISA, this is true. But uh, we are working on this uh, by applying other, um, uh, other system, catalytic system. But uh, of course, for the uh, immunotherapy, this is a good uh, result. Actually, in another work, not in this one, uh, we have just, pro just proved uh, the use for the uh, monitoring of uh, clinical patients that are, being, so, uh, that are, are um, being in a medical, uh, uh, medical staff and uh, uh, under the monitoring of trastuzumab in serum. So, yeah. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to the next speaker, Andrea Capucciati from University of Pavia. Hi, Andrea. Good afternoon. Hi. And can you hear me? I can hear and I can see you. So you can share your presentation. I cannot actually see any, I mean, I can only see, but I, it's blocked the, the image. I don't know if the other participants can see some, something else or can listen.
Andrea. So Andrea Capucciati is not here. Andrea Bonini. I'm here. Okay, so I think it's better if you start then if Andrea Capucciati will appear again, you will talk. Okay, so you okay. can start and uh, Andrea Bonini, so it's from University of Pisa. So please, you can share your presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Very okay, perfect. I'm start. Um, thanks to all organizers and scientific committee to invite me, not to give me this opportunity today uh, to in, give this talk about my uh, PhD topic entitled uh, CRISPR-Cas12 A-based electrochemical BSA for pathogenic bacteria detection. Uh, I'm Andrea Bonini, PhD student from University of Pisa in the Department of Chemistry and Industrial Chemistry in the come from lab of Chemistry Lab for Analytica Technology and Sensors under the supervision of Professor Fabio Di Francesco. And, um, Today, uh, I want to start this talk with um, two basic questions. Why and where is important to detect pathogenic bacteria? Because nowadays, one of the main issues uh, in the clinical setting is the... Um, um, is the... Um, okay, talk of this is not a problem. Okay, sorry. Um, today, one of the, the main issues in the clinical setting is the, um, the management of the nosocomial infection. These infections are in fact caused, mainly caused by bacteria, and if these infections are not uh, uh, detect, uh, rapidly detected, can, can make worse patient condition leading to death. Um, fortunately, the um, traditional techniques can be divided in culture-based and culturally independent approach, um, required a lot of time from the sample collection to response of analysis and are not able to respond to this request. So in uh, this scenario, we have need to a uh, low cost and portable, uh, we have need to develop a low cost and portable biosensing device able to detect a pathogenic bacteria close to the um, bed of the patients to help the medical diagnosis. Uh, probably you know, of course, the, the definition of biosensor. And when you want to develop a biosensor for detection of pathogenic bacteria, you can choose two different approaches. The first one is using a bioelement to detect a proteins present on the membrane on the surface of the, um, the, the surface of the bacteria. Uh, but this approach has less strain specificity and um, this uh, approach not provided more information about antibiotic resistance. Uh, if you want to have uh, more information about the uh, bacteria, you, need, you have to interrogate the genomic. In this case, we can use an uh, interaction with DNA, DNA, or using an enzyme, specifically with um, endonuclease enzyme. 
Inside, inside of this class, in the recent, uh, recent year, the researchers have uh, discovered a new family called the Cas family and uh, belong to the CRISPR Cas. Um, CRISPR Cas is an um, adaptive immunosystem present in archaea and bacteria uh, against the bacteriophage invasion. Inside of this mechanism, the researchers have discovered uh, that are present um, endonuclease enzyme called the Cas effector with, uh, with uh, three important characteristics. This en this en some of these enzymes uh, are programmable and uh, uh, has a, a um, very uh, selective uh, um, recognition process. Um, in this uh, Cas family, probably you know the Cas9 because it's the most famous for, for the uh, aid, aid, aid um, for the application such as uh, uh, gene editing or biosensing. But today I want to show you some um, characteristic of Cas12a because uh, uh, we have decided to um, develop this biosensing, electrochemical biosensing assay, uh, taking in advantage of the characteristic of Cas12. Um, as you can see in this slide, uh, you can uh, see two different uh, actors, the GAD-RNA. GAD-RNA is the programmable element and the um, uh, enzyme. When the enzyme meets the GAD-RNA, uh, make, make a complex, and this complex is able to recognize a specific portion inside of the DNA target. After the recognition process, the uh, enzyme is able to cut this uh, target in two specific uh, um, um, two specific uh, um, segment of DNA. This activity is uh, called the primer activity. Uh, and after this, this enzyme is able to switch uh, its conformation, opening a new subunity. Now the system show uh, um, uh, indiscriminate endonuclease activity against the single straight DNA. Uh, this activity is called cal collateral activity. The primary activity is a single turnover activity the, the, and means that the one complex is able to recognize one target. The collateral activity is a multi-turnover activity. Seem, uh, means that uh, um, acts like amplification of the primary activity. Um, taking advantage of the programmability of the system, the selectivity against the target and the amplification system inside of this mechanism, we have decided to uh, develop a biosensing assay. Uh, we have immobilized a single stray DNA on the gold, on the gold electro surface, and we have assessed the activity of the, this enzyme to detect two different bacteria by using electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. So now I'm going to show you uh, the validation of this uh, primary collateral activity in solution. And after the integration of this uh, enzyme activity in the, um, in the electrochemical transduction team. Uh, first, uh, we have selected two different um, bacteria, E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus, commonly uh, involved in infection disease. And uh, from its genomic, we have selected two housekeeping gene. Um, uh, we have amplified this gene, and we have checked the um, length of this gene by using a gel electrophoresis. These amplicants were used to the validate the primary collateral activity and the biosen electrochemical biosensing assay. First, as you can see here on the left, we have incubated the enzyme with a gut RNA that we have designed for specific target. And uh, this system was um, um, incubated with the, the target. First, we have evaluated the specificity. As you can see here, it's possible to see the entire gene of E. coli and the entire gene of Staphylococcus aureus. After the incubation with the enzyme and the specific RNA, the system was able to recognize the target and cut it both for E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus. After the specificity, we have evaluated the selectivity of this uh, system, and we have incubated both uh, uh, E. coli and Staphylococcus gene uh, in the presence of uh, enzyme and gut RNA, for example, in this case for the gut RNA specific for the E. coli, and the system was able to recognize and uh, cut only the E. coli target um, and this selectivity was evaluated also against the uh, Staphylococcus aureus. 
The primary activity was also evaluated uh, um, with the clinical isolate bacteria uh, selected for different infection from different to different countries. And uh, as you can see here in this uh, gel electrophoresis, the entire gene of uh, E. coli uh, isolate clinical E. coli, e. coli and Staphylococcus aureus. After the incubation with a specific and um, uh, gather RNA, the, for all uh, clinical isolate, the system was able to recognize and cut it for uh, both for E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus. After this, we have evaluated the collateral activity, adding the, in the solution the single strain DNA. Uh, it's possible to see here uh, the en entire single strain DNA, and after the incubation with the enzyme and gather RNA in the target, um, the, the system was able to uh, digest and degrade it at all uh, single strain DNA present in the solution, both for the uh, e. coli um, reference and Staphylococcus aureus um, bacteria, but also for the reference a clinical isolate also in this case. Um, we have designed so we have designed two different uh, um, gather RNA and we have tested it uh, against the um, uh, amplicons from E. coli Staphylococcus aureus, both for the reference and the clinical isolates. Um, after this, uh, now I'm going to show you the integration of this activity um, of the enzyme uh, on, on the electrode surface. Uh, first of all, we have modified a gold disc electrode with a DNA modified with a thiol alkene chain. And after this, we have passivated the surface with the mercaptesanol to guarantee the orientation of the um, self assembly layer. And we have checked the different uh, step with electrochemical techniques. First, it's possible to see in the cyclovoltammograms in the, in the black line, the clean electrode and the distance of, of peak increase after the functionalization with DNA and mercaptesanol. We have also evaluated the presence of the DNA on the electro surface with a chronocolometry in presence of the ruthenium metal mine. Um, in this case, the char positive charge of the ruthenium interact with the negative charge of the uh, DNA, and we have uh, um, assessed the accumulated charge on the surface. It's possible to see here in the orange line the accumulated change in the presence of the DNA and the accumulated change um, in, the, in the presence only of mercaptesanol in the green line, in the gray line. Um, after this, we have evaluated the, um, also um, by using a electrochemical impress spectroscopy. In this case, it's possible to see in the Nyquist plot the red charge transplant resistance increase in according with the, modific the modification of the electrode and according with also for the cyclovoltammetry. And after this, we have evaluated the impedance, the variation of the impedance in the solution. Um, this solution was optimized for the um, the, the enzyme and the monolayer reach the um, equilibrium after three hours. This time was chosen to uh, time to add the, the enzyme in, in, uh, in the solution. So after this, uh, it's possible to see here the response of the assay in the, um, the variation of the, the impedance in, in uh, increase of the concentration of the amplicons. It's possible to see that the system reached the saturation after nine, nine nanomolar of the target. And we have uh, shoes uh, three nanomolar like a cutoff value of this um, electrochemical BSA. Uh, in the of the solution in the same solution to check the uh, primary activity we have also um, uh, analyzed the solution um, by using electrophoresis techniques it's possible to see here the degradation of the um, dna target um, it's possible to conclude that the system was able to recognize amplicons of from bacteria in the range of the Three, uh, 0 and 18 nanomolar. Uh, of course, this uh, biosensing assay has some uh, limitation. For example, if you want to use this in a real case scenario, uh, you have to amplify the bacteria concentration from the um, 
from the patients to reach the 3 nanomolar cut uh, value of the this biosensing assay. And also this uh, was a principle validated in a standard condition, uh, elect, uh, electrochemical laboratory condition with uh, using a three, um, three electrode cell and a gold disc electrode. So to overcome this problem and to, and to moving in the direction to have a low cost and portable uh, um, devices and test. I'm now um, working and collaborated with Professor Alban Mercoci in the Bioelectronics and Biosensor Group to try to move this concept in a low cost and portable devices. Um, I want to thank uh, all my collaborators uh, from um, the Chemistry Lab for Indical Technology and Sensor in the University of Pisa, Department of Chemistry, in the Department of the Biology and uh, bioelectronics and biosensor group collaborators. And of course, uh, you for your, uh, for your kind attention. Uh, if there will be uh, some questions, I'm happy to try to reply. It. Thank you very much. So thank you, Andrea. Let's see if someone has some curiosity. No curiosity. Okay, so thanks again, Andrea Bonini, and let's welcome the last speaker of this first afternoon session, Andrea Capucciati. If he's here, let's see. Okay. Okay, can you see me? No, I can only can you hear. Yes, I can hear you, but I cannot see you. Can you? Uh, can you share your presentation at least? Yes. Okay, I can see your screen. Okay. Perfect, you can start. Um, good afternoon, I want to thank you the committee for this opportunity and uh, um, I want uh, uh, to thank you for uh, this, um, I want to explain my work at, uh, this, uh, at this meeting. In particular, uh, today I'm going to talk uh, about a rapid analytical method for the determination of psychoactive uh, substances, in particular the case of Lausin. Uh, Glaucin is, uh, um, um, is found in nature in the litex of various plants belonging to the Papaveracea family. In particular, it is the main component of uh, Glaucium flavum, uh, this uh, beautiful flower at the top of the um, slide. From a chemical point of view, it is a uh, dibenzo substituted uh, tertiary amine and uh, um, with the uh, um, methoxy group bind to the aromatic ring. The interest of the scientific community uh, in these alkaloids derives from the fact that uh, um, it, can, uh, um, it can have uh, antitussive and anti-inflammatory properties uh, similar to those of codeine. Uh, recent evidence uh, shows that uh, um, this, uh, um, this alkaloid can have a psychoactive activity and is classified among the so-called legal height. The aim of the work was uh, try to characterize the um, mechanism, the, the um, redox mechanism of this alkaloid using electrochemical method, in particular cyclic voltammetry and controlled potential electrolysis. Um, in addition, uh, um, we want to, um, to, obtain, to use a, um, new, uh, to obtain a new alternative analytical method based on differential pulse voltammetry, because um, due to the easy availability of uh, Glaucin, its use for recreational, recreational purpose is largely widespread uh, among uh, um, younger age uh, groups. In our work, we examined uh, other, the electrochemical behavior of other compound um, structurally related to glossin. In particular, um, this, uh, this, is one, uh, this is another alkaloid called tetrahydropalmitin. 
um, that uh, is very similar from an electrochemical point of view to glaucine. We also analyzed uh, several uh, tetrahydroisokinoline, uh, both uh, um, secondary and tertiary um, amine, with uh, um, methoxy uh, group or not. And also we examined a, a set of methoxy benzene uh, in order to better clarify the, um, the function of, uh, um, of the group, of this, of this uh, functional group uh, on the um, electrochemical mechanism of Lausin. We performed uh, um, cyclic voltammetry in a free electrode cell using glassy carbon as a working electrode. From uh, the uh, voltagram, it is possible to see four distinguishable uh, peaks. The uh, first one around uh, 1000 millivolt, and the second one are related to the oxidation of the, nit of the nitrogen atom. The uh, third and the fourth peaks are related to the oxidation of the methoxy group. Uh, in order to better understand the electrons that are involved in the um, electrochemical reaction, we performed exhaustive electrolysis, electrolysis uh, test uh, using a three electrode divided cell and a platinum goes as a working electrode. Um, to com to um, confirm our uh, um, hypothesis, um, in fact, uh, when uh, um, the consumption of one electron is uh, uh, correspond uh, to the correspond to the um, oxidation of the um, nitrogen group when the CPE experiment was performed at uh, 1,100 millivolt. Uh, in addition, we want to investigate the, react the reactivity of, at um, the highest potential performed a, a measurement at 1,900. Uh, Glaucin uh, consumes seven electrons, and uh, this high quantity of electron is, uh, um, um, is uh, due to the oxidation of the methoxy group and also is due to a reaction in which the um, polymerization and the um, degrade electro electrochemical degradation of byproduct occur. Uh, so the, um, the first peak uh, correspond to the formation of radical cation on the nitrogen atom. Um, this uh, um, radical cation can uh, um, exhibit a um, two uh, resonance structure. Further oxidation, after further oxidation, we obtain a cyclic cation. And then uh, after rearrangement and formal loss of methanol, we obtain a, a quinonic structure. Um, the, um, this is confirmed by the uh, cyclic voltammetry performed on uh, electrolyzed solution. From this voltagram, it is possible to see that uh, the glaucine after electrolysis uh, at uh, uh, 1,100 millivolt orange line um, it is possible uh, uh, to see the uh, disappearance of the first peak. Um, and uh, uh, if we use uh, higher potential, it is possible to see the disappearance of the uh, both of the two peaks uh, related to the um, nitrogen oxidation. In acid uh, medium, uh, the mechanism is, uh, um, is changed because uh, um, the um, protonation of this nitrogen atom um, is a uh, uh, um, this, uh, protonation. We have a bioelectronic oxidation in one step at, high, uh, at higher and positive potential. From the voltagram, it is possible to see that if, if we use uh, an excess of strong, of strong acid from 5 to uh, 50 equivalent, we, um, we saw the loss, uh, the disappearance of the, um, of the first peak and, and an increase of the second one. Uh, as I told before, uh, Glaucin is uh, an emergent drug and is sold in a capsule form. So it's important to try to quantify this, uh, um, this analyte in this pharmaceutical form. Uh, in addition, it's very important to try to distinguish the recreational use uh, 
uh, of this uh, alkaloid from uh, the uh, medical one. And for this reason, we uh, use urine for this analysis because urine are, um, contain traces of drugs or related metabolites in a higher concentration than other biological metrics such as plasma. Um, and uh, in addition, sampling is simpler, faster, and non-invasive. Our method consists of a, um, of a um, um, extra uh, extraction um, in a solid phase uh, uh, extraction. And uh, um, we use differential pulse voltammetry, an electrochemical method. Uh, the conditions are the same uh, um, that we use for cyclic, vo cyclic voltammetry. We use uh, uh, glassy carbon as a uh, working electrode, and uh, um, we uh, use the standard addition method. Um, in this uh, uh, case, uh, the calibration uh, curve was constructed in order to verify Uh, the linearity of the method, the, the uh, detection limit, and then quantification limit, and in the performance of the analytical method. In particular, load and lock were calculated using the uh, regression, uh, the linear regression at low concentration range of analyte. Um, the, uh, we applied this quantitative method to the um, pharmaceutical form in which uh, glaucin is present. Uh, for this reason, we prepared uh, uh, by mixing uh, uh, our analyte uh, with uh, other um, unrelated substances um, that are usually present in this pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical form that can interfere with uh, this analysis. Um, the, capsule, the, the capsules uh, were uh, prepared by mixing all the excipients, and after uh, um, that, we, the solution was filtered. Uh, in order to remove the undissolved um, lactose, calcium, and mannitol. Um, these uh, experiments uh, were carried out uh, using standard addition method, and uh, if you use uh, uh, 30 milligram of uh, uh, glaucin, we, can, we had a, a good recovery of our analyte. Um, For, for urine analysis, uh, in this case, uh, sample required preconcentration because it's essential to increase the um, concentration of analyte in the voltammogrammic cell. And uh, it is important also to reduce the, um, the matrix um, effect. Also, a cleanup uh, step uh, is important. Um, as the uh, unmetabolized compound in biological sample are um, expected to be in the range of uh, 0.25 microgram per ml. Um, so we spiked the urine with our, with our uh, analyte, glaucin. Uh, we brought uh, the pH around 8. And then we uh, charge um, the, the sample on the column. Uh, we use uh, fluorazil um, to remove to uh, remove the um, uh, the material um, that can interfere with uh, our analysis. After that, uh, the solid was washed with uh, water and uh, with a solution and uh, eluted, eluted with a solution. Um, a mix with uh, um, acetonitrile and uh, ammonia. In the, at the end, in conclusion, we, it is possible to say that uh, um, our first go goal was uh, to characterize the electrochemical mechanism of uh, uh, glaucin. Um, we also characterized the reaction mechanism of other several amine and methoxybenzene. And then um, we uh, develop a, a, a new um, analytical method based on electrochemical measurement, alternative to the chromatographic one that is, use, that is uh, currently used. Uh, the calibration uh, curve was, was uh, calculated. Um, we have a load and a lock. The lock is less than 0.5, is a good result. And uh, um, both from uh, uh, the pharmaceutical form and from the analysis, we can op 
we have uh, obtained a good uh, recovery. Uh, this uh, um, technique can be uh, used with other um, drug, um, for example, uh, um, with uh, uh, other tertiary amine, um, in order to quantify um, and to distinguish the recreational, the recreational use or the, um, the therapeutic use of substances. Thank you for your kind attention. Sorry, but uh, I have also problem with the video. Okay. Don't worry. Thank you for your presentation. I don't see any raised hands. So no, no questions for you. Okay, so you were the last speaker of this session. So now we do a little break. So we will be back at four. So we will have around like 12 minutes for a little coffee break. So see you at four. Bye.
Okay. So hi everyone, we are back again. So now it's time for Carmela Maria Montone from University of Rome, Sapienza. Carmela, are you there? Yes. Okay. I can hear you, but I don't see your screen and I don't see you. Don't see me? Ah, now yes. Okay. Okay, I see your screen. Okay. Perfect. Yes, perfect. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Iacarino, for a kind presentation. I would like uh, to the scientific committee for the opportunity to present my scientific result uh, at this conference. Today, I am going to discuss uh, developing an analytical uh, workflow for identification of bioactive peptides in soy flower. Soybean Gricine Max has been cultivated for five millennia in Asian countries with its derivative product, for example, soy milk, miso, tofu, etc. So it represents an important source of protein, about 40% of continents and peptides. Um, since the last century, uh, soybean cultivation has uh, become widespread in Western countries too. Uh, soy protein contains uh, all of the essential amino acid, so it rep represents a varied alternative to a food of animal origin. Furthermore, several biological functions and bioactivities have been attributed to their derivative peptides, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease prevention, hypocholesterolemic activity, antihypertensive activity, and antioxidant activity. In particular, antioxidant activities could have contrast several pathologies, uh, cosmaceutical and nutraceutical application. Uh, it is known that, uh, bio it is know that uh, um, uh, some specific amino acid sequence um, can have uh, one or more bioactivities. Many studies focus on identifying bioactive peptides which can be naturally present in food or can be obtained from parent protein in which they are encrypted. Um, bioactive peptides are generally 2 to 20 amino acids long, even if some bioactivities have been attributed to longer amino acids, for example, lunacin with 43 amino acids. Bioactive peptides can be produced by uh, food processing, for example, repeating, fermentation, or cooking, by storage, or by gastrointestinal digestion. Um, several methodologies are available for research and industrial application to obtain potential bioactive peptide encrypted in protein, including uh, chemical, uh, mechanical, and um, um, physical method. Treatment with enzyme is the most suitable one for preserving um, uh, functional and nutraceutical value. But the problem is the high cost and the bitter taste of the enzyme. To better simulate the physiological condition in which peptides are formed from proteins, human digestive enzymes are found in the stomach, intestine, and pancreas. For example, trypsin, fasciam trypsin, uh, papain, pepsin can be used. In this work, uh, analytical workflow for identification of short peptide and medium sized peptide was developed. In particular, a uh, method extraction for high protein yield and this applied to industrial scale up was developed. Um, in, uh, in, uh, at the first time, uh, an identification of short peptide has been introduced in analytical workflow. This is uh, an uh, analytical challenge. 
In the tails, uh, three different extraction protocols were tested in terms of protein recovery and also uh, minimize uh, the interference in the extract. Uh, in protocol A, a buffer with SDS, uh, sodium disease sulfate, was used. In contrast, glass microbeads and a buffer with SDC, uh, sodium deoxycolate, was uh, uh, used uh, to enhance the uh, um, the lysis of cell walls. In uh, protocol C, a buffer with uh, urea was used. Uh, a BCA assay was uh, employment for quantification of protein. Uh, the results are shown in a feature slide. This is, uh, in particular, protocol A gave the worst extraction efficiency and it was the most time consuming. For this reason, it is uh, unsuitable for industrial cell scale up. Protocol B gave the best result, but the employment of gas beads uh, does not allow uh, us to extraction of a large quantity of, of, um, of soy flour. Protocol C provided a similar result and, and was the fastest. For this reason, it was selected. Moreover, the other constituents of the buffer um, are suitable for the other analytical step. So, um, the, the protein obtained from best protocol, so uh, protocol C, were digested by simulated gastrointestinal digestion. Um, uh, se sequentially, pepsin, pancreatin, and alcochamotrypsin were used. Um, during uh, hydrolysis, pH, temperature, and uh, enzyme to substrate ratio were uh, carefully rechecked for reproducibility. The hydrolyzed peptide were purified by preparative liquid chromatography, collecting every five minutes one fraction for a total of six fraction. The fraction collected were tested for uh, an innovative antioxidant assay, developed in collaboration with the University of Federico II, Naples, um, um, this, uh, this channel conducted uh, in vivo on uh, human uh, gastric adenocarcinoma cell lines. Uh, the fraction uh, two and three uh, was tested. The remaining fraction uh, were excluded because uh, this fraction were cytotoxic. In fact, the choice to use a gastric cell line was determined by the need to evaluate the potential cytotoxic effect of the derivative peptide fraction justified the potential use as a functional food. Uh, so the cell uh, lines treated with the fraction two and fraction three um, show it uh, reduces ROS uh, levels compared with the cell lines treated with hydrogen peroxide. This result suggests that um, soy peptides have a good antioxidant activity. So after the bioactivity assay, the most activity fraction, fraction two and three, were characterized in terms of peptide. Uh, the medium sized peptide were analyzed by a shotgun proteomic approach using uh, nano ultra high performance lipid chromatography coupled to tandem mass spectrometry with identification based on a database search using a proteome discoverer and automatic software. The the analysis of a short peptide is completely different because a short peptide possesses a problem related to mass detection. In fact, short peptide sequence produces mainly single charge ions by electrospiral ionization. Another issue is uh, peptide identification. Still, unknown short peptide sequence cannot be confidentially identified by proteomic, proteomic software. So um, the, uh, the short uh, peptide uh, have been identified by suspect screening and target approach. This approach allowed us to overcome the limits of the common data dependent acquisition mode. Short peptide database was generating using MATLAB by combining masses and molecular formulas of natural amino acid. The combination of 20 natural amino acids in dye, tri, tetra 
peptides, um, re um, uh, resulting uh, 168,400 unique combinations. The filtered mass list was intended to be employed as an inclusion list. At the same time, the complete list was implemented in compound discoverer software to create a data processing workflow specifically dedicated to short peptide tentative identification. Uh, this is, uh, um, in these slides, possible to see the compound software in the interface. So uh, only exact mass were associated with the specified um, um, uh, specify amino acid sequence. For uh, the, um, the analysis of short peptide, it's necessary to, um, to study the MSMS -MS spectra. So it's necess necessary uh, to um, understand the fragmentation of a peptide. So in this slide, it's possible to see the peculiar fragmentation pathway of short peptide. Peptide bond fragmentation generating B and uh, Y ions. Uh, y ions, uh, moreover, have a free amino, amine group, uh, which boosts ionization. Another fragmentation uh, is uh, imminium ions. Uh, in the case of short sequence, in which peptide bond cleavage products several amino acids, imminium ions assume great importance, especially for proline methionine, aromatic, and alkaline amino acid. Natural losses from side chain must be considered. Uh, some amino acid, for example, asparagine, aspartic acid, glutamine, and glutamic acid are sometimes hard to distinguish because of water and ammonia losses, respectively. So with this approach, uh, it's possible to identify short peptide. In fact, it's possible uh, to analyze 132 unique amino acid sequence in fraction two and fraction three. Uh, six of these uh, um, peptide were already analyzed in, uh, for antioxidant activity and already uh, pre uh, present in a BioPEP database. In a table uh, in slide, it's possible to see the matrices in which they already study. Short peptide uh, were also analyzed with the peptide ranker, a software that predicts biological activity of peptides thanks to a neural algorithm. The software assigns a score of probability, even if 0.5 is the threshold value for considering potential bioactive peptide. A threshold value of 0.8 was selected to remove possible false positive. So 32 and 15 short peptides and a score of 0.5 and 0.8 respectively. For the analysis of medium sized peptide, 136 sequences were identified in fraction 2, and 60 um, sequences were identified in fraction 3. Regarding identified medium sized peptide, most of these peptides are derived from glycine, the major safe storage protein of soybean. In conclusion, the developed workflow allows us to identify two bioactive fractions, fraction two and fraction three, against uh, oxidative stress and non cytotoxic activity. Moreover, the workflow was implemented to do an industrial scale up. Uh, that's all. Uh, Thank you all of you for your kind attention, my research group and the, the uh, group of uh, uh, Federico Segundo for collaboration. Thank you very much for your presentation. So I don't know if there are some curiosity or questions. I don't see any raised hands. So I just have a, a curiosity, maybe you told, but I, I, I lost it, but the, which is the final uh, application of this work? I mean, once you find the, the fractions that are, uh, that are most active, then which is the final aim? Do you want to, to produce a, a food, a kind of superfood, something that is enriched with good peptides? Which is the uh, Yeah, it's possible to for um, cosmaceutical, nutraceutical, or uh, for uh, um, some um, food. It's a different application of, uh, of this. It's important that uh, only two fractions were uh, non, non cytotoxic. 
So this uh, workflow is very important uh, uh, for, uh, for the application. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. And we can go to the next speaker of this session. So it's Simone Cavalera from University of Torino. Good afternoon. Hi, Simone. So you can share your screen. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. So thank you for uh, thank you to the committee for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to present my work today. Uh, my work at the Department of Chemistry of the University of Turin is based on the bioanalytics, in particular on the development of a rapid diagnostic test based on the immunoanalytical uh, technology and the immunoanalytical chemistry in general. Uh, today, I am going to present uh, some very interesting results mined during the development of a rapid test, of a multiplex rapid test for the diagnosis and the serotype of the bovine foot and mouth disease virus. And uh, the technology we used uh, for uh, this device is the colorimetrics lateral flow immunoassay. So just two words about the diagnostic approach. It is split in two, com in two complementary approaches. The confirmation analysis that are sensitive and ultra specific, but they need a qualified personnel. They need the centralized laboratories. They cannot be carried on site and so on. So they need uh, the screening test. Uh, they are required to uh, facilitate and filter the workload of the confirmation laboratories. When a screening test fulfills all the uh, requirements uh, gathered under the acronym of REASSURED, as you can see in the slide, can be assumed as a point-of-care test. Among these point-of-care tests, the most successful technique is the lateral flow immunoassay. A typical antigen lateral flow immunoassay is based on the recognition of a viral antigen by two specific antibodies. One that is captured on a porous material, the nitrocellulose membrane, uh, that is uh, called uh, capture antibody, and a detection antibody that is uh, uh, generally labeled with something visible, in this case, gold nanoparticles. This uh, detection antibody is dry stored onto a fibrous material, typically glass fiber, and uh, the test is made, is uh, war, uh, works. Uh, uh, by adding the liquid sample to the sample pad, it resuspends the uh, detection antibody and they flow together through the nitrocellulose membrane, encountering the test line and the control line, giving or not the analytical signal. In the colorimetric lateral flow test, the, colo the color is given by the accumulation of the gold conjugate onto the reactive bands. Considering uh, that we can uh, draw uh, many lines on the same strip, uh, it is very um, important to understand that, that uh, the multiplex uh, capability of this technique is self-evident. As you can see, uh, it is uh, very widely used to diagnose and serotype infectious diseases. Why it is important to diagnose the, foot and, the bovine foot and mouth disease virus? It is a very highly contagious infectious diseases. It has a 100% of morbidity for susceptible population. It causes millions of losses in terms of animal lives and, um, and money. It is uh, worldwide spread in seven distinct uh, serotypes, uh, uh, where the whole A and Asia 1 serotypes are the most diffused in the Eurasian zone, uh, while the set 1, set 2, and set 3 serotypes are the African strains. Um, these infective diseases is, is generally diagnosed by laboratory testing uh, using uh, molecular methods such as uh, PCR, but also enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, so immunoanalytical techniques. But considering the high importance of uh, the prompt diagnosis on field, also uh, pencide, so-called pencide tests that are actually lateral flow tests. It is important to manage the outbreaks, but also the, to control the ring vaccination. 
Our purpose was to develop a multiplex lateral flow strip able to assess the general positivity to the disease, but also to serotype all the uh, Eurasian uh, strains of the virus. To do this, we used a set of specific monoclonal antibodies developed by the Istituto Zooprofilattico Sperimentale della Lombardia dell'Emilia Romagna. In particular, we used a pan-reactive antibody able to bind all the uh, Eurasian serotypes and some monoclonal antibodies that are specific, that are serotype specific. So to do this, we need to prepare uh, the pan-reactive antibody used for the detection of, uh, as a detection antibody. Um, and we did it by passive absorption onto the surface of the gold nanoparticles. Then we dry store the, uh, the solution, the uh, detection antibody solution into the fibrous materials, while onto the nitrocellulose membrane, we draw the lines with the specific antibodies, which is the important part of this project. As you can see in this slide, uh, two kind of different sandwiches are involved in this uh, device. As you can see, the general assessment of the uh, disease is made by using the uh, pan-reactive antibody, both for capture and for detection. It is an, an homologous sandwich. While for the serotype recognition, we use different antibodies. Uh, it is a heterologous sandwich, which is the different in what uh, happens uh, using two different antibodies. As you can see here, we uh, rise the uh, concentration, uh, the amount of probe into the device uh, from 0 0.5 to 2 uh, as an optical density into the uh, fibrous material and uh, observe what happened to the analytical colorimetric signal. And we noticed that for heterologous sandwich, so uh, in the control line and uh, on uh, the uh, serotype line, the trend is linear or, or almost linear. While for the homologous sandwich, we have a saturation-like behavior. Moreover, we observe that changing the position uh, from closer to further on respect to the uh, start of the run or respect to the sample pad where uh, the sample is added, it changes the uh, intensity of the color. We have an higher intensity uh, for a uh, closer test line. So what, why does it happen? Could it be the typical hook effect that occurs when I have a non-competitive uh, immunoassay? So let's look. The typical hook effect is made by uh, the uh, saturation of the probe, saturation of the detection antibody and the, the capture antibody by an excess of antigen. And it is usually uh, resolved by diluting the sample. But in this case, by diluting the sample, I have a decrease of the analytical signal. In addition, why it, uh, it happens to the homologous sandwich and not to the heterologous? The, uh, the answer is that it is not a typical hook effect. We uh, theorized an inverted hook effect. So uh, the reverse situation, the antigen is uh, saturated by the probe, is saturated by the detection antibody. And that's the reason for which uh, it happens with the homologous sandwich, because the capture and the detection antibody compete for the same epitopes of the antigen. And that's the reason for which uh, when the uh, test line is closer, <clears throat> the saturation is not yet complete. So more is the time the, time the uh, detection antibody and the antigen spent together, more is the probability of the saturation. So I have an, an higher signal to closer test line and a lower signal to further test line. So this allowed us to uh, set the final configuration, the homologous sandwich, uh, with the uh, general positivity to foot and mouth disease virus is set as the first test line, whereas the second, third, and fourth test line are the serotype specific. Then we test with, uh, in, uh, with the inactivated uh, cell supernatant, the matrix effect by fortifying um, epithelial tissue homogenates uh, with uh, these samples. And uh, we observed also the cross reactivity. 
And we observed that that, were no, that was no cross reactivity between serotypes, neither for the, uh, the negative samples, but also for the serotypes. And it is a, um, a promising result for a highly uh, serotype specific device. These data were, were confirmed by the on field sample. We tested 64. Um, 64 um, epithelial tissue homogenates from Kenya and from Tanzania. And uh, we confirmed our extreme specificity. We have 100% uh, of specificity between serotypes and with uh, the negative samples, but also a very high sensitivity, thanks uh, to our study on the behavior of the homologous sandwich that allowed us to have higher analytical signal. So in conclusion, we are uh, happy to say uh, that we have developed a very uh, performant um, device for the diagnosis and serotype for the Eurasian uh, strains of, the, uh, of these uh, infective diseases. We understand, most important, many things about the homogeneous behavior, the homogeneous, uh, the homogeneous sandwich behavior, because uh, we have to assess that um, considering that the capture and the detection antibody competes for the same epitope, we have to assume that um, the detection antibody is overwhelmingly favored because it passes more time with the antigen because it is in solution with the antigen. So the only way to uh, favor the capture is to set the test line next to the sample pad next to the start of the run and not to exaggerate with the amount of probe to avoid saturation that is counterproductive to high uh, amount of probe. So as a future perspective, uh, actually we have a, a present perspective because we already developed another test, another device for the uh, African serotypes. It is completely based on, on homologous sandwich, so the information achieved uh, in the first device were crucial. In this uh, kind of assay, I have uh, the first and the second test line to assess the positivity and the serotype at the same time. And the presence, as you can see on the right, of the uh, pan-reactive test lines alone means uh, uh, that is a positivity to the Eurasian strain. So uh, it's suggested to uh, perform the other device. And this, uh, this device is under on-field validation and we are gathering the results and that uh, will be uh, soon published. I would like to thank all the team that work to this project, in particular the Instituto Zoprofilattico Sperimentale della Lombardia dell'Emilia Romagna to de for the development, characterization and validation of the monoclonal antibodies, the support from the uh, Department of the Veterinary Science of Turin, the IN3 Diagnostic, and of course my research, gr um, research group, in particular Professor Laura Fossi and Alida Russo for uh, all the support and uh, help. And you, obviously, for your kind attention. So thank you, Simona, for your presentation. You're welcome. I think Stefano has a curiosity. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Simone, for your kind presentation and congratulations to all your group, all your research group, uh, for making all, always this very, very nice work. And uh, I, I have a question, maybe, maybe it's a technical question, because, okay, I'm not expert in the lateral flow immune assay, but um, in, is the size of the golden nanoparticles a factor that can influence this? this effect that you observe during experiments, so this, this hook effect to, to, to address this issue or, or the, the, the size of, of particles and the nature of particles uh, that you are using are not, uh, is not going to affect in the, 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 the results. Okay, thank you, Stefano. And um, uh, of course, it is a, a good question because uh, we, are, uh, we are working now uh, on this aspect, uh, uh, trying to explore many other parameters, uh, such as, as you well said, uh, the size of the nanoparticles, uh, and also uh, the, um, the concentration or the amount of 
of antibody adsorbed into onto the uh, gold nanoparticle surface as a uh, antibody uh, gold nanoparticle ratio so uh, we are exploring these um, these um, these variables and uh, i think uh, uh, we will soon have uh, a good uh, a good answer to your question uh, by our recent uh, uh, findings the concentration of the antibodies changes uh, not so much as the amount of probe and uh, the size of gold nanoparticles uh, have a, um, a, a very high Im impact in general because um, uh, uh, how can I say uh, little gold nanoparticles we can say little with uh, between 13 and 20 nanometers um give very low analytical signal in general so it uh, didn't help uh, to understand uh, many uh, to have many information from this uh, part in general it is useful to work with uh, big nanoparticles uh, let me say 40 nanometers uh, at least not too not too big because it tends to aggregate but uh, 40 nanometers is the optimal and in the family of the uh, around 40 nanometers gold nanoparticles the variables uh, most the most important variable uh, are the optical densities and the positioning of the test line yeah okay thank you very much simone you're welcome Okay, let's go to the next speaker. That is Jessica Brandi. Actually, Jessica Brandi could not be with us today, so she sent a video that we will show you now. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jessica Brandi, postdoctoral fellow from the University of Verona. First of all, I would like to thank the organization committee to give me the opportunity to present this work despite I'm not uh, physically present at the Congress. The title of my presentation is SWAT mass analysis revealed a mutant P53 secreted proteins influence on pancreatic cancer cells. I organized the presentation based on the following outline, so a brief introduction on pancreatic cancer and tumor suppressor gene P53, and then the aims of the project, the experimental design, the results and discussion of the project, and then conclusion and future perspective. Pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma is the most common type of pancreatic cancer. It is characterized by poor prognosis with a dismal overall 5-year survival rate of 5%. A typical feature of PDAC is the lack of early phase specific symptoms that leads to a late stage diagnosis. In addition, the absence of early biomarkers, detection method and chemoresistance are the main drivers of poor prognosis in PDAC. In particular, chemoresistance is caused primarily by genetic alteration, which favor disorder in the apoptotic pathway. One of the most important proteins involved in the DNA damage repair and apoptosis is the tumor suppressor protein P53 which regulates a wide range of cellular biological processes to prevent tumor formation by killing or delay the growth of neoplastic cells. And uh, the, the importance of the P53 pathway in the tumor suppression is also highlighted by the observation that the P53 mutations are associated to poor prognosis and they are present in about half of all human cancer, reaching the 75% in PDAC patients. The great majority of the P53 alteration mutations are missense mutations that are localized in the DNA binding domain. 
In particular, this mutation are grouped in two main types, the conformational mutation, such as the uh, 175 mutation, and the structural, uh, the contact mutation, sorry, that, uh, for example, are the 273, which cause structural modification in the binding domain or affect the DNA binding ability of the protein. In addition, uh, these mutants can acquire also new oncogenic function and uh, for this reason they are named gain on function mutants. In fact, they can regulate the transcription of different set of genes that can induce the cancer aggressiveness. In particular, this results in the development of the typical hallmarks of cancer cells that carry the mutant P53 genes. For example, chemo resistance, metabolic alteration and genomic instability. Moreover, many recent studies reveal that the role of P53 mutant proteins in the modification of the tumor microenvironment and also in the septum of cancer cells. For these reasons, in the present study, we investigate the functional effect of mutant P53 driving secretum of PDAC cells, demonstrating its impact on several animal of cancer cells, such as hyperproliferation, chemoresistance, inhibition of apoptosis and autophagy, cell migration and epithelial to mesenchymal transition. To identify uh, a mutant P53-dependent signature of secreted proteins by PDAC cells, we have performed also a proteomic approach based on SWAT MS technology. Here I have reported a summary model of the approach using this study. Very briefly, the P53 null ASPC1 cell were transfected with plasmin for the 273 and 175 mutant P53 overexpression or its mock vector. Then the cell transfected were incubated with a fresh culture medium for further 22 hours to accumulate secreted proteins. And after that, the conditioned media of the ASPC1 transfected cells was transferred to untransfected cells. And after 48 hours, several biological phenomena that are listed uh, here in the figure were investigated. <clears throat> in parallel, the conditioned media was collected and secreted proteins were extracted and subjected to high solution digestion. Then a SWAT MS based proteomic has been applied by using a micro LC interface to a triple TOF mass spectrometer equipped with a duo spray ion source and CDS. For identification purpose, the sample were subjected to data-dependent analysis. For the quantification, the sample were subjected to cyclic data-independent analysis of the mass spectra using a 25 uh, data window. Finally, the identified regulated proteins were subjected to bioinformatic analysis. As concerning the functional assay, we demonstrated that the mutant P53-derived conditioned media was able to counteract apoptosis in P53 null ASPC1 cells. In particular, uh, we found that conditioned media released by 175 and 273 mutant ASPC1 cancer cells decrease the amount of intracellular autophagic vesicles compared to the P53 null driven conditioned media as reported in this figure. Moreover, we investigated whether a mutant P53 driven secretome may also be able to reduce cancer cell sensitivity to the gemcitabine, which is the gold standard for the treatment of PDAC. And we found that uh, um, <clears throat> gensatabine inhibited the cell growth of uh, ASPC1 cells cultivated with mock-derived conditioned media 
and uh, while uh, sorry the conditional media derived from the 273 and uh, in particular counteracted the therapeutic effect of gemcitabine as reported here uh, as compared to its mock control so uh, this represents an important aspect for uh, the uh, considering it uh, for clinical therapeutic studies we discover also that uh, the mutant, uh, the two mutants can favor the migration of uh, ASPC1 cells. In fact, we observe a faster wound closure in p 53 null ASPC1 cell cultivated with the two mutants driving secretum as compared with the control as reported in, the, in these figures. And finally, we show also that the 175 mutant P53 increased the uh, N covering and decreased the epithelial covering proteins uh, expression in the cell membrane that is a, a typical feature of epithelial to mesenchymal transition. After the investigation of the oncogenic function of mutant P53 driven secretum, we aim to identify the main differentially secreted proteins. So we analyze the protein composition of the conditioned media released by ASPC1 cells expressing the neo function mutant P53 uh, compared to the P53 null uh, ASPC1 cells. Uh, SWAT MS analysis were performed in triplicate uh, for each analyzed samples uh, and they were important in the Skyline software for the uh, label free quantification and identification of regulated proteins. We identify in particular 194 proteins for the mutant 273 and 228 for the mutant 175. A major part of these proteins were found in common 165. As regarding the uh, regulated proteins, we found 45 proteins for the mutant 273, 58 for the mutant 175, and 15 differentially secreting proteins were found in common. Here uh, I have reported the list of the 15 differentially common secreted proteins by both the two uh, mutants, isoforms. And among these proteins that can better represent a common signature of the secretum alteration by different gain of function mutant P53 isoform, uh, there are several interesting security proteins which are involved, for example, in cell migration and invasion that are highlighted in red, or in uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition that are highlighted in blue, and finally in the cancer uh, progression that are highlighted in yellow. Then we perform also the pathway enrichment analysis that revealed that the conditioned media uh, 175 samples are enriched in proteins uh, related to extracellular matrix, in particular here on the right, uh, also present uh, in the other uh, mutant, and an interesting enrichment uh, in proteins uh, that are involved in the glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. And moreover, the string software was employed to investigate the functional and physical protein interaction among P53 and the differentially secreted proteins. In this case, we found that 11 proteins clustered in a tight interaction network centered on P53. In particular, the most interesting is the nuclear protein ion mobility group A1, that is a known prognostic marker for living cancer, lung cancer, endometrial cancer, and also pancreatic cancer in particular. And so uh, these data all together uh, can give a better understanding on the complex nature of protein differentially secreted by mutant P53. In conclusion, this data show that uh, there is a key role of the T uh, P53 
gene in the network of the differentially secreted proteins. And SWOT mass analysis reveal that uh, the alteration of mutant P53 secreted proteins on pancreatic cancer cells can promote cancer aggressiveness in an autocrine paracrine manner and moreover regulate the cancer stroma relationship. Uh, further investigation are needed to uh, discover the role and biological impact in cancer microenvironment. And we will also aim to investigate whether some of these differentially secreted proteins may constitute a secreted signature uh, detectable in a PIDAC serum sample. This might also enable the identification of target therapies that are specifically addressed to inhibit the growth of PIDAX carrying oncogenic mutant P53, which are strongly resistant to traditional chemotherapies. I would, add, uh, would like to thank the group of uh, my university, the University of Verona, in particular the responsible of the project, uh, Professor Massimo Donadelli, and my tutor, Professor Daniela Cecconi. My colleagues that uh, helped me uh, with the experiments, uh, in particular uh, Giovanna Butera and Giuliano Siragusa, and the group of Professor Emilio Marengo of the University of Piemonte Orientale for the mass spectrometry analysis. You can find uh, in the, the literature our uh, publication uh, here I have reported uh, the title, uh, complete title of the article in uh, the biomolecules. And uh, I also uh, want to thank you for your attention and uh, you can uh, ask me many questions also by using my email that is jessica.brandi.univr.it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, we can now go to the last oral of this session. So we have Pavlos Nicolaou from University of Bologna. Here I am, yes. Hi. Okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Yes. Okay. 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 Perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Pablo Nicolaou from University of Bologna. I'm a PhD candidate and uh, I'm working in the laboratory of Professor uh, Giovanni Valenti, uh, Professor uh, Francesco Paolucci. Uh, I will present you uh, my research and uh, the aim of my, my research, the PCR free whole genome determination by electrogenerated chemiluminescence. Uh, a small introduction about electrochemiluminescence, abbreviated DCL, which is a luminescent phenomenon uh, used by electrochemical stimulus. Uh, first, the professor Alan Bard is the father of this technique, and uh, since 1994, that uh, also we can see in this graph, ECL has uh, been attracted to the scientific uh, interest of uh, many groups. The main mechanism uh, of ECL is the annihilation mechanism, uh, which is held on the aplotic solvent. Uh, the same species is oxidized and uh, reduced in the surface of an electrode. As a result, the oxidized and reduced species, they, uh, they react to each other. And the final result is the creation of a excited state. Once the, this species is, is uh, released from excited state to the ground state, we can see luminescence. Uh, not only in uh, aprotic solvents we can see uh, the luminescence we can have uh, ECL, but, on, uh, but also in water solution. Uh, some advantages uh, in this case is uh, no light source, uh, no light scattering with extremely low background and uh, large range of linearity. Uh, according to these uh, advantages, we can uh, create, we, we can develop uh, biosensors and uh, quantify biomolecules. Uh, in this case, we, we use uh, coreagents, we need coreagents, because coreagents are molecules we can reduce and oxidize or oxidize, 
and uh, create uh, radicals. The stars uh, in this technique in the isolated water is the uh, tetropylamine uh, and uh, ruthenium. In this point, uh, I would like to open a parenthesis. Uh, I will not be focused on my presentation, but it's good to be mentioned. Uh, Roche and the Hitachi company uh, have collaborated and uh, they create a machine called uh, Alexis uh, based on initial imaging and it's uh, available commercial. In this project, uh, as luminophores, we will, uh, we will see the ruthenium with two ligands of uh, fermanthroline and one ligand of uh, dipyridophanazine. As co-reagent, we will use potassium persulfate. Both molecules can be reduced in the different poten potential. Uh, on, the, uh, on the one hand, uh, potassium persulfate can create radical anions. On the other hand, uh, we, we have the uh, reduced ruthenium, they react each other, and uh, the, uh, we have the creation uh, of the ruthenium in excited state. Uh, the final result is the luminescent. Some uh, uh, properties of uh, ruthenium, and especially the, the DPPZ ligand, is uh, that using this ligand, ruthenium can be intercalated in the groups of DNA, uh, 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 using also uh, the purines. Once the, the ruthenium is intercalated in the groups of DNA, it becomes a photochemically active molecule. On the other hand, DNA uh, can protect the nitrogen uh, uh, molecules in, the, uh, in these ligands, in this ligand, uh, for, for, from uh, oxygen, oxygen species. The oxygen species can quench the excited state. Uh, we will uh, focus on a hepatitis B virus, uh, HBV uh, virus, which is a double strand DNA virus. Uh, it, we can uh, find it in uh, uh, Asia, Africa, and uh, North America, uh, South America. And according to the World Health Organization, since uh, 2015, more than 200 million people were living with a chronic HBV uh, infection. Uh, this means that we need to develop fast and ultra sensitive methods. Uh, one method is the PCR that uh, also in our days, it's the famous technique uh, with a really low limit of detection around uh, 10, uh, 10 copies per, uh, uh, per reaction. But also there are some disadvantages. The is a high cost technique and only a skilled person can use it. I would like to underline the the last disadvantage uh, that the amplification of DNA is required. Because in our case, we can recognize the HBV genome without any amplification, only using the two probes, two thiolated probes, P1 and P2, which are DNA sequences. And uh, according to uh, chemistry between gold and thiol, we can immobilize onto the uh, electron charge phase. To saturate the, the surface, uh, we use a thiol and also to avoid the specific uh, adsorption. And uh, as, I, uh, as uh, P1 and P2 are uh, antiparallel complementary to uh, HBV DNA, and also using parameters such as high temperature and uh, acid environment, pH 5.5, uh, these parameters lead to keep protonated the G and C uh, basis of DNA. So we have the triplex formation uh, between the probes and the DNA. Uh, and the last step in this, uh, in this procedure is the adding uh, is the add of uh, the luminophores. I would like to, to say that uh, uh, after every step, we clean the surface of electron with, with a few drops uh, of uh, PBS uh, solution, and uh, this procedure uh, have been submit, has been submitted as patent and uh, as also article uh, research article. Uh, to per the performance uh, in our electrode, of course, we need electrochemical technique, in this case, uh, cyclic voltammetry, and uh, we are going to reduce the surface of an electrode, uh, uh, sending electrons. So once we reduce the probes, the DNA is, is reduced. So that means also the intercalated ruthenium is also reduced. 
Uh, at the same time, the core reagent is reduced, and according that, to the mechanism that I described before, uh, we see the, uh, the luminescence. Not only that, but also we can verify the presence of uh, HBV genome. So according to that, we worked in a range from zero to 10,000 copies uh, per uh, microliter. So uh, according to this, uh, to this graph, is CL intensity versus the potential, uh, we see that uh, as much as the concentration is increased, also the ACL intensity is increased. Analyzing the, the peak of each curve, we can uh, uh, create, we can make calibration plot. The correlation between ECL intensity and the uh, HBV concentration is logarithmic, and uh, one uh, parameter uh, is the really low limit of detection, which is 2.4 uh, copies per uh, microliter. Uh, some uh, uh, other parameters can affect the ECL signal, which are the, which, uh, are the number of the probes. Only, only when we have P1 probe immobilized in the surface, phase, we owe uh, 1.34 uh, as ECL intensity. When we have only P2, the ECL intensity is 0 0.14. And only when we, we have both probes immobilized on the gold electrode, the um, the ECL intensity is the sum of uh, P1 and P2 uh, probes. Uh, so that happens because uh, only when we have the probes, the two probes mobilized on the surface, we achieve to take the lowest energy in the system. The lowest energy in the system, the highest equilibrium constant uh, is. Uh, also, uh, the biological matrices, when I say biological matrices, I mean urea, saliva, or blood is an important parameter in the, bio, in the biosensor field. So we, uh, we use FBS, uh, fetal bovine serum, instead, instead of uh, PBS, and uh, we perform the same uh, uh, experiment uh, for three different concentrations of uh, virus. Uh, no huge differences are observed in both in three both cases, uh, so that means that does not affect uh, the change of biological matrices. Also, the selectivity has uh, been tested. We perform and uh, we do the same experiment with uh, the DS DNA of uh, bacterium. Uh, but as I said before, as I said before, the P1 and P2 probes are complementary and anti parallel only of uh, the uh, DSDNA of HBV, so not reflex formation is, uh, is created. That means that we don't have any luminescence, something which is very verified uh, in, the, in this graph. Uh, we, this is the important part of uh, this project. Uh, we, do this, we did the same uh, experiment uh, uh, using extracted DNA using a plasmid. And uh, in this case, uh, we worked in a really low uh, range from zero to only one copies per microliter. Uh, also in this case, uh, as, much, as much as the, the uh, concentration uh, is increased, it is increasing also the uh, ECL intensity. Uh, analyzing the, uh, the, uh, the ECL intensity of each curve, um, we take uh, some information uh, such as also in this case, the ACL intensity has a, a logarithmic co correlation with the HBV concentration, and uh, the, the, low, the limit of detection is 0 0.05 copies uh, per uh, microliter. But uh, I said before uh, about extracted and synthetic genome. We uh, determine both genomes, but we have uh, two different limits of detection. This happened. Uh, why? Because according to our last uh, uh, publication, uh, we know that uh, the ACL intensity is depend on uh, the distance between gold electrode, uh, electrode in general, and the luminophores. So uh, the length in the extracted genome is uh, smaller than the length in the synthetic genome. So we suppose that uh, the DSDNA is placed closer to the surface of an electrode. 
Uh, uh, this protocol, uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to present also uh, uh, results in the COVID-19 uh, uh, application, but this protocol can be used on, also in the COVID-19 RNA. But in this case, we use three probes instead of uh, two probes in the case of uh, uh, HBV. Uh, to conclude the presentation, uh, that everybody knows that the development of uh, this kind of sensor is uh, crucial also in our days. Um, so we managed to develop an ultra, an ultra sensitive sensor with a really low limit of detection, uh, 0.1 uh, atomolar, and uh, we managed to do uh, extra experiments to, uh, to transfer our system in a point of care. Uh, sensor. So uh, I would like to thank uh, my professors of the group, uh, Professor Francisco Paolucci, Professor Giovanni Valenti, all of my colleagues, my collaborators, and uh, the print project that uh, funds this re uh, research. And of course, uh, all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Paulos. Let's move on to not I, I have a question. Thank you, Pavlos, for your uh, very interesting work. Thank you very much. And I have uh, one practical question and one uh, future perspective question. So the practical question is, uh, experimentally, how do you, how do you find the, 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 the good distance between the two probes on the same, uh, on the same electrode or um, in, in other words, how do you optimize this, this uh, the, the, the density of the probes? And the future perspective question is, uh, do you think th this um, approach can be, can be made uh, reagent free one day, for example, using different uh, substrates, uh, different co-reagents or something like this? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a really good question. Uh, the distance between two probes, uh, actually the length of uh, the virus also is uh, uh, 42 nano nanometer. So uh, it's impossible to have only 42 nanometers in every case. There are also uh, the distance uh, 22 nanometers, 23 nanometers, but the lowest energy we obtained uh, only when we have 42 nanometers. So that uh, uh, is uh, proved uh, by molecular dynamics uh, with our collaborators are uh, responsible to do that, uh, that work and not uh, specialize on that. Uh, but uh, I, I suppose that uh, because the, the length of a whole genome is 42 nanometers, it can be placed uh, uh, better in uh, nanometers, uh, in 42 nanometers. According to the second uh, question, uh, I think uh, it uh, it could be it could be because uh, uh, we are going um, to perform the same protocol uh, about other uh, other viruses and uh, about other core agents. Um, I, I don't know. I have uh, we have to 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 see it uh, uh, experimentally. Okay. Thank you. No, I, I so sorry. I, I made this question because every time that I I have a talk with uh, with Giovanni Valenti, I always ask him, "Hey, why why you don't try with paper?" So this was the the the, the nature of the question. So let's thank you say, very much. And let, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, let, let's say that uh, we take advantage uh, that from the chemistry between gold and uh, um, the thiol. Uh, we're going to perform this uh, sensor in the screen printed electrons, the uh, commercially available electrons. But uh, I think if we have paper electrons and one substance uh, with uh, gold, gold nanoparticles uh, to mobilize the probes on the gold nanoparticles, it could be a great idea. It could be. Um, it, it could be. Uh, I, I, I have to see it experiment, uh, experimentally. Thank you, Pavlos. Uh, thank you. Congratulations to you all your group and collaborators. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
there, sorry, there was no audio. Uh, I told that we have done with the oral communication and we can start with three styles, light and talk. So the first one is Patrick, uh, and I don't know how to pronounce the surname. So Patrick, if you are there, you can share uh, your Yes, I am. Uh, can you hear me? Carlos, can you share the screen? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Carlos, you should, okay. Uh, can you see the, uh, the poster? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, so hello. Uh, my name is Patrick Szymaszek. I'm a PhD student on Krakow University of Technology. Uh, and I'd like to uh, say a few words about my research about uh, fluorescent probes uh, for detection of albumin. Uh, the main, of, the main uh, purpose of the study was to, like I said, uh, develop uh, efficient fluorescent probes to uh, detect uh, concentrations of albumin uh, in urine or in the blood samples. Uh, as a candidate to this, uh, we use uh, amine pyridine uh, derivatives presented in uh, top right corner. Uh, first step was to uh, measure the uh, spectroscopic characteristics of these compounds, uh, absorption and fluorescence. Uh, those compounds uh, possess a very uh, wide range of absorbance up to uh, 550 nanometers uh, with maximum of absorption uh, something around uh, 425 nanometers uh, with uh, very high uh, excitation coefficient over 10,000. Uh, they possess very high po uh, potential as a very sensitive uh, probes uh, to uh, research. Uh, BSA, a bovine serum albumin uh, protein was used as a model protein uh, due to its very high similarity to human serum albumin. And the first step was a titration study. Uh, we used a uh, fixed concentration of uh, each probe and titrated it with uh, increasing concentration of uh, BSA to uh, examine if the probe is sensitive to this uh, protein. Uh, the measured fluorescent spectra is shown on, uh, in figure one, uh, as can be seen with uh, mm. additional uh, amounts of BSA the uh, absorption band was increased. And for all three uh, probes, uh, this uh, correlation was true uh, with a different um, scope, but still. Uh, on the basis of this study, we uh, calculated limit of detection in quantitation. And the limits was very low. Uh, for probes P70 and P89, uh, it was uh, of the order of magnitude to the minus seven, and for P71 to the minus eight. <clears throat> uh, to comparison, this uh, limit of detection with a moderate amount of uh, albumin in blood, which is uh, something around two uh, to the uh, order of magnitude of minus five. Uh, we are two orders or even three orders of magnitude uh, below the um, proper concentration in blood. Uh, the next step was to uh, calculate determined uh, binding parameters uh, of the interaction between BSA and uh, each probe. Uh, binding parameters such as uh, Stern-Volmer Stern constant, uh, number of binding signs, and the uh, binding strength between those individuals. Uh, binding strength is KB, uh, presented uh, in the table. Uh, it's of the order of magnitude 10 to 4 which is a moderate uh, variable, um, it's okay uh, strength. The number of uh, binding sites between uh, BSI and the probe uh, was in stichometry one-to-one. Uh, moreover, the Stern-Volmer constants with comparison of the uh, maximum scattering, uh, the collisional uh, constant, allowed to conclude that the uh, quenching of the fluorescence of BSA was due to a static interaction for probes P70 and P89. And for P71 was due to dynamic quenching. Uh, to confirm that, uh, we used a temperature dependence uh, study and which confirmed that for P70 and P89 it was uh, static and for, P and for P71 it was uh, mixed quenching. 
Next, we use a study to identify the binding sites um, on the BSA in which are the probes bound. Uh, to this, we use uh, DNSA and flufenamic acid as uh, site markers for uh, the sites. Uh, as, can we, as can be seen on the figure four, uh, after addition of flufenamic acid, the fluorescence intensity of uh, each probe was gradually decreased, which indicate that, the, uh, that those probes been uh, in the site two of uh, BSA. Uh, moreover, uh, we perform a first resonance energy transfer experiment to confirm that uh, if the energy, energy transfer between BSA and each probe took place. Uh, as can be seen on in the table, the energy transfer efficiency and the Forster distance uh, allow to conclude that uh, this energy transfer can take place uh, and occur with very high probability. Uh, as a conclusion, I can say that the, taking into consideration all of the performed study and data, uh, those probes can be used as our efficient fluorescent probes for detection of albumin. And thank you for your attention. Thank you to you, Patrick. So let's go to the second slide and talk, Andrea Cerrato from University of Rome, Sapienza. Hi, hi. Uh, I need Patrick to, you know. Uh, Patrick, please, could you unshare? Uh, yeah, ah, okay. That's like... <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Do you see the presentation? That's perfect. Okay. Good evening, everyone, everyone, and thanks to the scientific committee for giving me the opportunity to be here today. I'm going to present one of the latest research that I've been carrying out during the third year of my PhD. Uh, lipidomics is one of the um, omic science, which was originally born as a branch of metabolomics, but uh, that has nowadays gained its own proper analytical techniques that were um, mentioned earlier by previous speakers today at this conference. At present, when uh, it comes to untargeted um, um, analysis of the lipid species, uh, high-resolution mass spectrometry represents the foremost technique given its um, uh, enhanced uh, sensitivity. However, in the mass spectrometric determination of lipid species, there are several drawbacks. One of the main drawbacks that has been nowadays addressed by several research groups is the isomeric mass overlaps. Uh, the isomeric mass overlaps occur anytime it's, uh, different lipid species of different classes, when are subject to as the ionization, generate different adducts that um, present the same uh, molecular composition. As such, those adducts uh, make it um, much harder for software programs to correctly assign those adducts and subsequently to identify the, the lipid spaces. In this work, we focused on the isomeric mass overlaps of phosphatidylcholines in negative mass spectrometry. And for their structure, we present um, a quaternary ammonium group. When they're subject to as ionization, they uh, undergo in source fragmentation with the loss of a methyl. Those demethylated adducts are often uh, hard to um, assign, and they are um, often uh, misinterpreted as a debrotonated adduct of, of uh, lower uh, molecular weight uh, phosphatidylcholines or phosphatidylethanolamines. Moreover, those um, quaternary ammonium groups could interact with formate or acetate adducts if they are present in the um, chromatographic buffers. As such, the, uh, the format and acetate adducts can still be misinterpreted to one another and both present the same molecular composition of phosphatidyl serines uh, deprotonated adducts. In this complex context, we proposed a buffer modification workflow, which is a new methodology which has been introduced uh, uh, in the the 2020 um, uh, of the, by the group of Lu and uh, has never been applied to the field of lipidomics. Our methodologies, um, as the um, refers with the use of unlabeled and deuterated acetic acid in the chromatographic buffer, to made uh, um, to force the phosphatidylcholines uh, to um, form two acetate adducts, one with the 
regular acetic acid and one with the deuterated. The method that we propose is simple, cheap, and sample independent. It doesn't need for extensive sample preparation or instrument modification. It has no effect on other lipid species. That means that the other lipid species that they are not prone to interact with acetate ions will not be affected with this modification. The generation of these high abundance um, uh, acetate and deuterated acetate adducts allow an easier discrimination of phosphatidylcholines and phosphatidylethanolamines. And at the same time, the fact that there are two rather than one adducts allows an easier format versus acetate isomeric mass overlap solving, as well as PCs and PSs. The method that we uh, proposed was uh, optimized by a box bank and design of experiments uh, to um, maximize the generation of the acetate adducts and the overall ionization efficiency, and then compared to a regular lipidomics workflow, which employed the same uh, sample preparation and instrumental condition, except for the use of the, of the deuterated acetic acid. We then use the same um, software engine for the uh, automatic identification of phosphatidylcholines, which is compound discoverer, because we wanted to test the, the effect of the modification on the workflow uh, on the algorithms of the software. As you can see in the table in the right side of the slide, thanks to the buffer modification workflow, we were able to identify more than three times the number of phosphatidyl coins and with a much lower false positive rates. It seems in fact, as is shown in the, in the prints of the spectra in the bottom right corner, that when two rather than one acetate adducts are present, the algorithms of the software are much more prone to correctly assign the effective uh, structure of the adux. If you see um, the spectra recorded with the standard workflow uh, for the same molecule, it uh, only um, it, um, was misinterpreted as a deprotonated adux. As such, this simple modification could allow solving most of the isomeric mass overlaps of these classes of lipids, while still being able to perform a retrospective analysis of other lipid classes which are not affected by this workflow. Um, I'm finished. I want to thank, of course, all the members of my research group and all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. And now let's go to the last speaker of the day, Claudio, Claudio Ignazio Santo from University of Bologna. Good afternoon. Hi, Claudio. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Good afternoon to all. I'm Claudio Ignacio Santo, a PhD student of the Electrochemistry and Mo of Molecular and Functional Material Group of the University of Bologna. Today, I'll show you my current research about electrochemiluminescence biosensor on borrowed doped diamond electrode. Electrochemiluminescent biosensor have recently gained a prominent place among uh, um, detection methods of biomarkers such as uh, proteins, hormones, and uh, nucleic acid. Electrochemiluminescence is a luminescent phenomenon induced by an electrochemical stimulus. Uh, Recently, uh, the development of a CL coreactant mechanism allowed it to exploit um, the advantages of the electrochemiluminescence in aqueous environment. Con consequently, the um, electrochemiluminescence became a leading technique in the biomarker detection, also thanks to its advantages such as high signal to noise ratio, high sense due to the absence of a life source, uh, high sensitivity and very rapid measurements of a small molecule, of a small, um, small volume. Sorry. Um, there are more uh, in, um, there are different commercial uh, SEL based, uh, bits based um, devices. Uh, here I report the COBAS of Roche Diagnostics that are, uh, that is able to detect more than 150 uh, immune assay in a very short time. In the commercial um, immune assay bits based the device and system, the biomarkers are uh, uh, detected after the immunorecognition 
through a creation of a, a lablet sandwich, uh, lablet sandwich uh, uh, immune assay, and um, attached to the man magnetic beads um, using and exploiting the strong uh, streptavid biotin bond. Uh, the uh, ma magnetic micro beads are um, attracted to the working electrosurface using a magnet, and after uh, potential application and uh, addiction of um, coreactant solution, the SEL is acquired. Moreover, the main disadvantages of this uh, technique of the CL in aqueous uh, solution is the, necess the high potential necessary to produce light, typically 1.4 volt, that could cause some modification on the electro surfaces, for example, gold or platinum electrode, and uh, uh, the generation of bubbles from water oxidation. What could be the solution to this problem? The heterogeneous uh, uh, electron transfer are deeply dependent on electron material. Uh, so the right choice of uh, electron material is a crucial point for, uh, in order to maximize the CL efficiency. Here I show you the uh, SEL application on borrowed double diamond electrode that is uh, two bits based the immune assay system. Borrowed double diamond electrode is um, exhibit a very superior properties such as wide potential window, high sensitivity, high chemical stability, and uh, uh, low background current. In um, thanks to this property, it could be a uh, it could solve this, uh, the problem seen before. Uh, here we um, develop, we perform analysis with two different de detectors, the photomultiplier tube, that is the commonly used uh, detector in uh, commercial uh, bit-based immune assay, and uh, another one in which we have a microscope connected to the um, uh, CCD camera, so-called SEL microscopy that uh, allow, allow us to um, study the physical chemical properties of single bead uh, SEL uh, electrochemical luminescence emission. In both cases, we obtain a very clearly visible signal and um, a very low background. This performance born of a diamond electrode uh, let us explore also new reaction with a coreagent, uh, coreactant um, less toxic than tripropylamine. Um, but uh, they that have uh, a very high oxidation potential not reachable with uh, the other platinum mode called electrodes. So for the diamond, it's only the, the, the only one usable. Uh, this is a, a new part of, the, of this project that I will study during my PhD project. Finally, I will thank uh, the organization, the, uh, the organizing committee to, uh, for allowing me to present my research project. The, my research group of the Bologna University, Professor Francesco Paolucci, Giovanni Valenti, and all my colleagues, and the group of Professor Einaga of the KU University for the collaboration of this project. And finally, thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Claudio. And with you, we have finished it with all the speakers of this afternoon session. So I want to thank all of you for being here and also all the speakers of the morning session. And uh, I want to remind that uh, we will give the prize as best oral presentation and best poster. And we, the, the winners will be notified by email uh, after the whole Congress will be, will be finished. So thank you again. Thank you to you and to all the attendees. Uh, we had uh, really a lot of super interesting contribution. So with this, I say goodbye to you and see you tomorrow for the medicinal chemistry session. So have a good evening and goodbye everyone. <laughs>